This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one tool for building a website that I've been using for years. Usually our video production work involves a lot of travel. And of course in 2020, that all went away. So we spent a lot of time refining our home studio setup. I use it for my remote video interviews for my podcast. And my wife Anya has been doing live TV segments where she's broadcasting to the station from this home setup. So we're gonna show you how we do all this in a relatively small space and for a lower budget than a proper TV studio. I'm gonna break this all down into different categories and you're not gonna need all the same gear that we use here. And in fact, in the links in the description, I'm gonna include some more affordable alternatives so that you don't have to spend too much money, but you could still get this exact same effect. Let's start off by talking about the cameras that we're using. So the main camera I'm talking to right now, this is the Canon C200, which I absolutely love and it's become a really good value. The price has come down on it over the years. And then over here, we've got the EOS R running as our B camera. This allows us to do either close-ups or wide shots at the same time and it cuts nicely with the C200. I wouldn't really recommend it as a primary A camera. I would recommend something that you can record without a time limit. It's really frustrating when I am using the R and I need to keep restarting it every half hour. And other cameras like it, even the new R6 or R5 that I wanna replace it with, they have limitations when you're shooting video. They're more useful in smaller bursts, like shooting either B-roll or cinematic stuff. But when you're talking for a long time straight to camera, you want something that's not gonna turn off, it's not gonna cut you off. Hopefully it has some XLR inputs, easy ways to put audio in, good monitoring tools so you can check what's in focus. I prefer autofocus as well so that you don't need somebody else fixing that for you. On the C200 right now, I'm using the Sigma 18 to 35 1.8 lens, which I use all the time on there just so I can have that little bit of zoom. If I need to move in and out in a studio, zoom is very helpful because I can't always move the tripod further away. And then on the R, we've got the 24 to 70 right now. That changes sometimes depending whether we're using it for a close up or a wide shot. This is my favorite part, let's talk lights. I've got the Aperture 300D that is my soft key light over here. And I'm actually bouncing it into a sound blanket, a white sound blanket. And then after that bounce, it's coming through a huge reflector. It's very diffused and a big source. So yeah, it's just, as soft as possible. And then since this is a very echoey room, I mean, you can still hear it right now, the sound blankets help out a lot. I'll talk about that more when we're talking about audio. And then there's a second 300D that is working as a fill light. It is just kind of bouncing up into the ceiling and into the corner, and that fills in the light behind me. I don't always use this light. Sometimes if I want a darker atmosphere, I'll turn it off and the light behind me goes down. It just depends from going for light and bright or dark and moody. And a little comment about how powerful of lights that you need. A lot of people will go for something like the 120D, which works very well, especially if it's just going through a softbox. But that amount of output isn't really enough when you start bouncing it around or sending it through multiple layers of diffusion or making it really big. That's why I like the 300 and I'm very excited about the Aperture 600D. All that extra output gives you way more options of what you're gonna do with it. And then there's also a very subtle but cool light that I like what it's doing here. This is the Lupo Action Panel Full Color. And right now it's just creating a little rim light on the side of my face. Because I can, I'm actually gonna take it down. I've been having a lot of fun with this light lately. It is a full spectrum RGB panel, so I can change it to match whatever's going on in the background. That's typically what I do. I'll use it as an extra light that kind of complements whatever's happening behind me. And it can also run on V-mount battery power. That's why I can just carry it around right now. I'm using the DNO lighting V-mount 95 watt hour battery packs right now. And this whole kit together is just, I mean, it's really fun. It's super lightweight. <laughs> it doesn't have the same output as the apertures. I wouldn't be using this as a key light, but for a fill or to add something into the background, it's really great. Right now you're hearing me through the Deity S Mic 2. This microphone has such incredible value and I've been using it for almost every video since the day I got it. There's tons of shotgun microphones to choose from, but this one performs at a level above its price range. Or if you're looking for something smaller, there's also the Deity S Mic 2S, very similar, smaller. Sometimes I actually kind of prefer that one. But I do use another microphone pretty often, and that's because a lot of the time I am podcasting for that, I like my Heil PR40. And this mic, this is really meant to be spoken into relatively close, so this is what it'll sound like typically when I'm speaking on the podcast. And the mic that you choose just really depends on what you're doing. If you're, let's say, streaming, I'd recommend something that you speak to closely and sounds amazing and cuts out a lot of the echo. Shotgun mic is a bit of a compromise. It's as close as I can get it, but it does pick up a lot more of the reverb in this cement room. 
Consistently one of the most underrated parts of audio and one that we struggle with here is the room that you're speaking in. Since our space is dedicated for studio use, there's not a lot of furniture in here, which means there's not a lot of sound absorption. It's very echoey. So that's why behind the cameras and beside me, I've got sound blankets and foam panels trying to absorb as much of the echo as possible. And no matter what, it's terrible. I think the only way I could really fix it is carpets and sound panels on the ceiling. I don't know. But the number one solution is sound blankets. And I try to find something that has black on one side and white on the other so you can either use it as a bounce or a negative fill. Again, links to everything will be in the description. So those are the ways that we capture audio and video signals, but now, what do we do with it? I record the podcast into the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3, and it has the best preamps of anything I've ever used. And the PR40 really needs good preamps. Just like the Shure SM7B, it needs a lot of extra gain to get the signal sounding good. So if your preamps are noisy, your audio will be too. In addition to the studio I've been having a lot of fun with is the Blackmagic Atem Mini Pro. This is basically a TV switcher, so you can plug a bunch of HDMI signals into it, and it can either record them by plugging a hard drive directly into the switcher, or it can send that signal out to any streaming source in your computer or to Skype, which is what I do for the podcast, and it's also what we did for Anya's TV segment. And while you're streaming or recording, you can switch between up to four different video sources and audio sources. There are so many crazy things you can do with this. We've just started scratching the surface of it, but it really opens up a lot of doors. This might be overkill for you. If you just want, say, one 4K signal to go into your computer, link in description for how to do that. Actually, a lot of cameras have started releasing software so that you can stream directly over USB. It's crazy that it took this long to happen, but it's very helpful. So thanks, Sony, Canon, and anyone else that plans on doing this. Very critical to all of this is a monitor that is just dedicated to seeing what you're recording. So this whole time that I'm talking to you, I'm looking off to the side and I can, I can see myself and make sure I'm not doing anything stupid, which definitely hasn't stopped me from doing it before. My monitor is the BenQ PD3220U. It's not so important which one you're using, but what's really critical is that it's as big as can fit in the space that you're using. You need to see a lot of what's going on to catch the mistakes you'll inevitably make. The classic example that's happened to me a few times is parts of a jacket will leave fuzz on my beard. And when I don't notice, it's quite embarrassing. We also use a teleprompter and it is made by ICANN and it's powered by an iPad Pro 11 inch. But what's really cool is when we're doing remote interviews or when Anya is on TV, we can see the person on the other side right in front of us. So instead of having a computer that we're looking down at, we can basically make eye contact with the lens and we're seeing the person at the same time. It's one of those details that isn't completely necessary, but makes us feel like we're taking things to the next level. And then when I need to move to the next slide, I can just control it with my iPhone and press play. It's time for a huge thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And I know that you guys are a savvy audience. You already know that Squarespace is a powerful all-in-one tool built to host your next web project. From online stores to a portfolio, it's insanely simple to create a home for yourself on the internet. It's easy to create full screen video backgrounds so people can see your work as soon as they land on the site. Or you can use the video block tool that lets you easily embed videos from YouTube, Vimeo, or wherever without bogging down the page with all that messy embed code. Just set your own thumbnail and now YouTube code doesn't load until the user clicks on the video. You've got full control of your web presence. And of course, you also know about their great customer support and that they have fully customizable mobile responsive templates. But I bet that you've got friends and colleagues that don't know how much Squarespace could help them out executing their next idea. So give them a hand by going to squarespace.com to start a free trial. You'll have a fully functional website up and running in minutes. And when they're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Tyler Stallman to save 10% on their first purchase of a website or domain using offer code Tyler Stallman. So thanks again, Squarespace, for sponsoring this video, but also so for hosting my website for the last decade. So those are the other most important things in the studio. Of course, there's lots of other little details that keep it running like stands and clamps and tape and there's just studio junk all over the place. Good cables, very important. And if you wanna learn even more about this stuff, I'd go subscribe to the podcast. It has its own YouTube channel. And I talk to other creators, filmmakers, photographers about how they do what they do, the gear and our inspiration and all of that stuff. Just go to stallmanpodcast.com Thanks again for watching guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Because they have announced the R5 and the R6, and the positioning of the six has been like, it's not quite as good as the five, uh, you know, it's yeah. more of a replacement for the, uh, the 6D. Worse sensor, way more noise, way less dynamic range, like images looked worse if you took them on the 6D versus the 5D, you could see it.
the positioning now of the R6 is like a, a solid step below the R5 is just wrong. I'm super excited. And the reason, like a, a, a lot of because of what you said, I have the C500 Mark II now as my main A-roll camera. And I've been looking for something to do B-roll with. And I was looking at the EOS R, but with the rumors about the ERS, the EO, I'm going to keep saying this wrong, EOS R5 yep, and R6. Wrong. I just waited and I, I wanted like, yeah, you know, like Armando was like, oh, like goosing it up. It's going to be like a baby C500. None of us own 8K uh, TVs. Uh, you know, I just got my first really, really beautiful 4K TV. And I've started to realize that at like proper viewing distance, there isn't an important difference between the 1080 and 4K that I watch on it. 